I'm Celia Mertzbacher. Welcome, everyone. I am executive director of the QEDC. And it's, there's a little lag, so I hope connection is okay. But uh, greetings to uh, folks. We've got approaching 50 on the call today. That's great for a midsummer day. Um, this is the third in a monthly series that we've started called Quantum Marketplace where we showcase some of the QEDC member companies and we'll be doing these uh, on a regular basis. So if you're interested in participating in a quantum marketplace webinar, contact Crystal Bouvereau or myself, Whippich, and um, we will talk with you about uh, getting, getting a program together. So um, the purpose is not only to showcase the QEDC members, um, but to connect them to customers. And um, in some instances, they have their own supply issues and bottlenecks and pain points. And so it's really about connecting um, partners, partners up and down the supply chain. Um, we really appreciate the uh, effort that the presenters you're gonna hear from today have made to put together a nice uh, set of presentations about their company. And in between those presentations, there will be time for a moderated discussion with Mark Whippich. Um, QEDC, as I think all of you know, is about enabling and growing the quantum industry. And cryogenic systems and technologies are a critical part of many quantum systems. So we're delighted to have uh, among our members a number of companies that work in that space. And um, so I will now turn it over to Mark and we'll be hearing from some of those companies today. So Mark, over to you. Great, thank you, Celia. So uh, let's go into the next slide. So we're, we're going to uh, have a brief um, slide on the lineup. Um, and if we have time, we'll go into the upcoming schedule for future webinars, et cetera, et cetera. And, and also we're going to have a Q&A, not only as Celia said, at the end of each presentation for four minutes or up to, and then also at the end, uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll open it up to more free flowing discussion. So next slide. Great, so today we have Rich from Cryomech, we have Jack from Form Factor, we have Scott from Lakeshore, and we have Yun Hun from Janus ULT, and we have Mark from Montana Instruments. So Rich, are you ready to go? I am. Great. So why don't you share your screen? Okay. Green light, go. <laughs> <laughs> Looking. Can you see me? Are we good? Yeah, I can see you. I can see the slides. We're good. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and greetings from not so sunny Syracuse. I hope this uh, thunderstorm behind me doesn't interrupt too much. But like Mark said, my name is Rich Dosman, and I'm the president here at Cryomec where we design, develop, and, and manufacture Gifford McMahon style cryocoolers, as well as cryogenic systems, such as liquid helium plants, liquid nitrogen plants, and specialized cryostats. We're a growing company with close to 150 team members, and we currently produce about 20 systems per week, which puts us in the thousand systems per year range. We, in addition to our manufacturing side of the business, we also have our very active, innovative, and important R&D group. And we like to refer to this group with a lowercase r and an uppercase t to emphasize that while we do spend some time on research, we do uh, spend most of our All starts with Bill Gifford, inventor of the Gifford McMahon refrigeration cycle and founder of Cryomech in 1963. Fast forward 58 years, and here we are in front of our brand new state of the art custom built facility of 72,000 square feet. We're 100% employee owned and committed to carrying on Bill's legacy of continual innovation 
listening to and partnering with our customers, and equally as, the, equally as important, preparing for our future. Cryomech manufactures the most extensive, most powerful line of cryocoolers available in the world. Our latest example is the recent release of the PT425 pulse tube cryocooler, which provides 2.7 watts at 4.2K. This is an impressive increase in performance, which, uh, of which was our previous power, most powerful system, our 2 watt PT420. And equally as impressive is the fact that uh, this PT425 is the same physical size and draws the same amount of input power as our 2 watt cryocooler. The remote motor version of the PT425, pictured on the right, delivers 2.35 watts of cooling power at 4.2K. Our remote motor PTs are an enabling technology for dilution refrigerators, which is our current arm's length connection to the quantum ecosystem. We supply custom designed cryocoolers to each of the world's dilution refrigerator manufacturers. In turn, dilution refrigerators are an enabling technology for quantum computer manufacturers like the IBM and Googles of the world that employ superconducting qubits. Larger, more powerful quantum computers are forecasted in the timelines and technology roadmaps of all the quantum computer manufacturers. The scaling from present day 50 qubit systems to 1000 qubit systems within the next three to five years will require more powerful cryogenic platforms. To keep pace with this advancing technology, we have been focused on designing and developing larger cryocoolers. Jumping to the opposite side of that spectrum, the QEDC put out a call for advanced cryogenic solutions to accelerate research and commercialization of quantum information, science, and technology. To answer this call, Cryomech is focusing in on what's been termed low C-swap cryocooler technology. That's low cost, size, weight, and power. This technology will enable deployment of small cryogenic quantum sensors and cryogenic quantum network repeater nodes. These quantum network repeater nodes would benefit from highly efficient superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. We are developing a sub 3K pulse tube that will cool an SNSPD manufactured by fellow QEDC member Quantum Opus. This development is partially funded through the QEDC and will provide what we believe to be a first step towards C-SWAP cryocooler technology. And finally, like everyone else these days, it seems we're looking for help. In the true Bill Gifford Cryomech spirit of continuous innovation, listening to and partnering with the scientific community, we're looking for assistance from technical collaborators, QIST product developers, and any others in the quantum community, com quantum community to advance the necessary low C-swap cryocooler technology and provide input to aid in the design of our next generation products. We look forward to connecting with you and innovating the technology of tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. And here is my and our contact information. Great, thanks, Rich. Uh, can you go back up to slide five? Slide five. Yeah, so can you, um, so you're, so Cryomec is a key supplier to dilution refrigerator manufacturers. So you're an OEM supplier, right? Yes, yes. And, and so, and you're shipping pretty high volume per year. Um, you know, so, so this more powerful pulse tube cryocooler under development, can you share a bit more about that? Um, maybe a, a small bit about that. Um, as I said, our, our largest cryocooler right now uh, is 2.7 watts at uh, 4.2. And currently, um, you know, we're, we're hoping for another 50% increase quite possibly in the cooling power. Uh, we've not turned it on yet. We're working towards that. So we'll know more probably in the next oh, two to three months. Great, and that's that's pretty important, right? Because in the marketplace, 
uh, as, as, as one um, person I talked to in the cryo space says, you know, the, the quantum computing companies that need dilution refrigerators keep needing to build bigger dilution refrigerators. Right. right. And, and, and many of the dilution refrigerators being built now have multiple cryo coolers in them. So you're talking footprint space for the compressor systems that go with those cryo coolers larger uh, footprint dilution refrigerators to house those multiple cryo coolers. So the more powerful cryo coolers then would reduce the number needed um, because they, they provide that cooling power in a single unit as opposed to multiple. Oh, I see, I see. So now you get more space. More space and hopefully less input power as well. I see, I see, great. And then can you go to slide seven? Sure. Actually, here's a, a question from Raymond Bunker. Um, can you comment on any developments with respect to vibration mitigation for dilution refrigerators? Um, you know, I can only speak to what we do here. Um, and that's the reason why the dilution refrigeration folks use our remote motor. Um, what that does is it separates the electrical motor from the actual uh, cold finger, which reduces vibrations so that it's less work for the dilution refrigeration manufacturers to dampen out any vibrations coming in from our pulse tube. So um, they each all do their own work um, as far as dampening vibration and how they connect our pulse tube to their dilution refrigerators with whether it's braid, um, straps, thermal straps, uh, those types of things. But that's really um, the dilution refrigeration manufacturers technology and probably trade secrets. I got it. I got it. Thank you. And and single photon detection is a is a, is another hot area. Uh, you know, can you share a bit more about the cryo technology you're working on there? Um, a little bit. That's uh, something new. Uh, certainly less than three K. Um, as what was called for here, right? We have a base temperature of less than 3K and a heat lift of about 100 milliwatts at 4 Kelvin. So we're sort of aiming in that area. Um, and, and the whole difficult, I guess, there is, you know, that's a, a different realm. We've not gone there before for us uh, personally here with our technology. And so it's not only the pulse tube itself, but it's also the compressor technology uh, to draw that less the, than a kilowatt input power, uh, long maintenance cycles. So that's the challenge. And that's why I'm saying we're reaching out to the quantum computer uh, uh, community um, to, to network and to collaborate with because this technology isn't there and it's gonna take a number of us, I think, putting our heads together and, and really advancing the technology. Great, great, thanks, Rich. And ho hopefully we can do some more Q&A at the end. Very, very impressive. Thank you. Yep. So, uh, Jack, let's get your presentation up. Jack from Form Factor. All right, we got the slides up here. You're good. Yep, go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Jack DeGrave. I'm a business development scientist with Form Factor, and today I'll be introducing the cryogenic test and measurement product portfolio uh, for, for Form Factor. So, Form Factor has uh, been a publicly traded company since 1993. Uh, we have about 2,200 employees worldwide, and over the last 12 months, we've done a, uh, just over 700 million in revenue. Uh, what I'll be focusing on today is the cryogenic test and measurement product portfolio. So we span a temperature range from about 300 Kelvin down to 50 millikelvin. Uh, beyond that, Form Factor has a wide range of probe systems and probe cards for both engineering and production applications, uh, with a presence of about 8,500 labs worldwide. Uh, when it comes to quantum, we serve a couple main uh, applications. Uh, one of the major ones right now is photonic device testing. Uh, we also do a lot of cryogenic characterization, including things like cryo CMOS. And uh, we have systems for high frequency devices as well. 
So Form Factor has really positioned its product portfolio to address the, the concerns of somebody who might be starting out the R&D and engineer, engineering level and then looking to scale that up either into um, you know, engineering volumes or niche production volumes, and then going all the way up through full production, which include things like automated wafer prober systems and probe cards. Uh, we find that customers who get started early with us in the R&D and engineering phases are really able to improve device yield and they get more data quickly, which ultimately accelerates the path from concept to volume production. Here's an overview of the major cryogenic uh, products that, we, um, that we're currently selling. Uh, these, each one of these products is also offered as a test service. Um, so if you're not sure quite uh, what product is gonna get you the information you need, uh, you can work with us on test services to try out the instrumentation. So on the far left here is our qubit pretest system. So this consists of an ADR cryostat with a 50 millikelvin base temperature. Um, and it makes use of this PQ500 probe socket that I'll explain in a little bit more detail. Uh, after that, we have a 4K base uh, temperature probe station. So this is shown in purple. Uh, around the outside of the sample stage, you'll see independently manipulated probe arms, um, or at least uh, nano positioners that can be outfitted with probe arms. And then next to that in the blue is the rapid chip, uh, chip testing system. Uh, so this system uses a load lock interface to take a chip from 300 Kelvin down to four Kelvin in less than an hour. Uh, no wire bonding is required for a chip like this. And then on the far right in the orange is our new uh, fully automated 4.5K wafer probing system. Uh, and this is uh, the IQ3000. So this system can be equipped uh, with over 56 RF contacts and uh, greater than 300 DC contacts and is fully compatible with probe cards. So one of the things we're seeing in the industry is we're seeing a lot of researchers trying to understand what they can measure at 300 Kelvin versus what they can measure at four Kelvin. Because ultimately doing test and measurement at, at cryogenic temperatures is, is much more expensive than doing it at room temperature. So Form Factor has products that can make those measurements at 300 Kelvin and at 4 Kelvin. And we've seen uh, many, many customers able to really shorten their development cycles um, and improve device yield, which has really uh, increased the speed at which you can go through a development cycle. And then the last product I'll introduce here is our qubit pre-characterization system. Uh, so this system has really been designed for qubit and resonator pre-characterization, especially for uh, superconducting qubits and spin qubits. Um, so here uh, we're showing the PQ500 probe socket. Uh, this will accept bare singulated dye. So no wire bonding and no packaging is required and you can cool down a chip uh, in less than 16 hours. So this allows uh, researchers to find uh, high performing devices fast and really limit the number of failed cool downs um, in, in a dilution refrigerator, which is a time consuming and costly cool down. So with that, I'll say that we're looking for partners and customers to help shape our product roadmap. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're walking hand in hand with the quantum community. Uh, if you wanna find out more about Form Factor, please check out the website at formfactor.com. We have global sales offices and our cryogenic product line is manufactured and headquartered in Boulder, Colorado. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jack. So um, can you go back to your, um, service, your product and services slide? Yeah, so, so you guys are offering the whole gamut here. Um, as, as quantum gets more mature, um, wh where do you see the most interesting um, areas of growth moving forward or pain um, points it, solving for customers? Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we're seeing is that there's still this fundamental uncertainty on what information can you obtain, obtain at 300 Kelvin versus what can you obtain at, at uh, the low temperatures. And, um, a lot of customers are working through that in, in different ways. And it, it also depends upon the particular modality that you're looking at. So uh, for instance, photonic uh, probing and some of the advancements there might require the, um, the lower base temperatures, especially when you're starting to look at integrated devices, things that might have photon sources, waveguides and detectors all on a single chip. Um, that's something that you really wanna be probing at cryogenic temperatures. Whereas some of the you know, test control or, or even some of the Krauss CMOS stuff can be done at higher temperatures. Um, so I think as we go forward, systems that provide customers a lot of data is really going to advance materials development programs as well as some of the, you know, the fundamental structures that go into a quantum processing unit. 
Okay, great. Um, and then, um, what new what new areas are you looking at? Uh, as form factor looking at working in in quantum. Uh, anything that's not on this list here that you can uh, tease us a little bit. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we're we're really trying to do is uh, develop um, a solid application engineering team to really help facilitate uh, programs that are looking to scale up. Um, so we've got um, you know the the rapid chip test is a big project for us right now. The IQ two thousand. Um, so we think that's going to provide uh, researchers with a lot of data very quickly at the chip scale level. Um, we, we noticed that a lot of people um, can really benefit by skipping the wire bonding process and getting data on their systems before that. Uh, so we're definitely focused on that. And then, you know, looking at um, how might the automated wafer prober system need to scale um, to accommodate some of the um, quantum development programs out there. So, you know, looking at uh, larger wafers, more RF and DC contacts and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Anybody else questions, Jack? I guess we may have some more at the end. Thank you, Jack. All right, thank you. Yep. Okay, Scott, Yano, Lakeshore, you're up. All right. Let's see if I can uh, figure out how to get slides up. See, Mark, am I able to share? Yeah, you should be able to. Here we go. All right. You guys see the slides? Yep. 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 All right. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Yano, CTO with Lakeshore Cryotronics. And today, uh, like everyone else here, we're going to be talking about uh, what we're doing, especially in the space of, of quantum technology development. So uh, Lakeshore as a company, uh, we kind of have three main market sub segments. Uh, we play in aerospace, uh, advanced research, and then also testing. Uh, and the focus today will be in a lot of the work that we're doing in the research space uh, through all things quantum. So just a, a quick splattering of many of our customers. Um, you know, I feel like one of the, the best parts of my job is I literally get to work with some of the smartest people in the world. Um, and, and our customers really drive us, uh, they push us, and, and that's a great thing to keep developing technology uh, that enables them to do the, the great scientific discovery that they're working on. Um, so how we do it, um, we work through our, we've developed many core competencies over the years, um, and I'll just uh, leave this slide up here um, so that you guys can see some of what we consider our, our core enabling uh, competencies that really help us do technology development. Um, and one of the biggest areas that we've increased our capability of is in the area of cryogenic cooling. So last year, uh, Lakeshore acquired the laboratory cryogenics uh, business from Janus Research. Um, and, um, and that's been a great uh, a boost uh, in, in terms of our, our capability. Now, I just wanna say that the, uh, the ultra low temperature division of, of what was Janus Research continues to operate as a separate company um, known as Janus ULT. Um, so the easy way to think about it is if you need a, a dilution refrigerator or helium-3 system, uh, please give our friends over there at Janus ULT a call. But for uh, systems and, and solutions above about one Kelvin, um, that's, now, that's now part of Lakeshore. And uh, we're really excited to be working in, with uh, all the folks formerly at Janus and continue the, the strong legacy that they've built um, through their, their brand. So now looking at, at Lakeshore solutions today, uh, we have five main areas. And uh, most, uh, most folks probably on this call are very familiar with our first one being our, our temperature space. So obviously we have our full line of, of cryogenic sensors and probes, um, including our, our ultra low temperature capability. Um, second big area for Lakeshore is all of our magnetic products. So again, uh, magnetic sensors and probes um, and really specializing on high field and cryogenic capability in, in that space. Um, our material characterization systems, um, including Hall effect systems, magnetometers, and our full line of cryogenic wafer probers. Um, and now, um, more recently, um, obviously the, the addition of the Janus cryogenic cryostat line, um, as well as our ability to do uh, more customer uh, driven cryogenic solutions. Um, and the one that most folks probably aren't too much aware with is uh, all of our work in software. Um, and what we're really trying to do with our new MeasureLink software is really bring all of these pieces together. Um, and coordinate and automate uh, characterization systems for our customers. 
So how are we doing this specifically for quantum technology? Uh, give you a few examples. So again, um, Lakeshore in, in our deep uh, thermometry expertise, uh, we've been working in the regime of ultra low temperature thermometry uh, for, for many years. Um, and just recently with the push of, of quantum technology development and especially quantum computing, um, we pushed our calibration accuracies down to five millikelvin. So we all now offer a fully calibrated uh, ruthenium oxide sensor down to five millikelvin. Um, in the area of quantum spectroscopy, um, especially with the addition of the Janus product line, um, we're developing a lot more solutions um, around optical measurements. Um, you know, the, the trapped ion, the atom cooling uh, techniques, um, and we have deep expertise, uh, especially in low vibration systems and ultra, ultra high vacuum systems. Uh, now moving to more device characterization, um, working with a lot of our customers on early stage device testing uh, down to 1.5 Kelvin. Um, and really um, a big area we're seeing is the drive electronics for quantum systems. Um, an enormous amount of work kind of in this 1.5 to 4 Kelvin space um, is, is a big heavy focus for us right now. And then finally, as I kind of mentioned before, um, what we're seeing the need is from the market is really complete solutions. Um, you know, speeding that time to first measurement because the, the technology is, uh, is changing so rapidly um, and really uh, reducing the integration complexity. Um, you know, most of the technology is, is very sensitive. And uh, uh, those of you that have tried to build custom systems, you know that things like ground loops and uh, RF noise can, can really wreak havoc on your measurement. So by controlling the measurement instrumentation, the, the cryogenic and magnetic field divide, uh, environment, the probes, the wiring all the way down to the experiment um, and wrapping software around all that solution really is an area um, of, of need that we're seeing within the market. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk with you all today. Um, and I just wanna leave uh, these questions up on the, the board. Um, if you have a need um, in any of these spaces or areas, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself. Or if you just uh, are interested in some Lakeshore products, uh, there's our general sales contact there as well. So thank you. You're muted. Slide, uh, can you, thanks, Scott. Can you go back to slide four or five? I think it's one of those. Four or five, I can. One with the, where it has the Janus on there as well. Oh, this one, yes. One more, it's, there it is, yeah, okay. So you guys have a whole lot of areas and solutions uh, and, and that's great. Um, so, and then with your acquisition of that part of the Janus business, what do you see as the, the next key area of growth moving forward? What, what are you looking to add from here? Right. So um, for, for my team, um, Lakeshore, it's really working with the Janus team, uh, what was formerly the Janus team, especially understanding all the optical um, opportunities. Um, as I mentioned briefly, um, you know, trapped ion, um, uh, the, the trapped uh, ion architecture, um, as, a, as a quantum computing architecture is, is really driving forward, um, as is the cold atom uh, techniques. So understanding the needs of our customers around basic research for integrating the need for um, the optical measurements as well as electronic measurements at the precision level is a big focus for us right now. I see, I see, great. Great, any other questions? Uh, maybe go back to the last slide. Okay. Yeah, and I'd remiss to, of course, say that we are, are certainly not sitting on our laurels and not developing any new uh, thermometry uh, <laughs> thermometry products for uh, driving at the, the quantum target. So we absolutely are continuing our, our development of, of all things thermometry. Yeah, great. And then are you looking to, so you say you're, you're, you're open to partnering and collaborating um, in the audience here. Who are you looking most to partner with? Yeah, so, you know, a choice. Uh, yeah. a range. you know, as Celia mentioned, kind of in her opening statement, um, you know, what is what is the pain point? Well, honestly, the biggest pain point for for me and my team is really identifying those emerging needs. You know, what does the you know, as, as part of the QEDC, um, we feel strongly that part of our role is helping to enable the, the development of technology. So what are the measurement needs and measurement solutions? That, that you know the, the, the folks doing the hard work 
um, need that they don't currently have. And um, that's where we'd be uh, very interested in, in talking. And so they should just reach out to you when you're the CTO, right? Absolutely. And have those conversations. Great. If, if it's not myself, I can put them in contact with the right person. And no yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks, Scott. Um, let's go to the next presenter. Okay, so I need to... Zheng Hoon. Share. Hello. Hello. Right. <laughs> how are you? Good. How are you? Good. Can you yes. share your screen? Yes. So. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Chung Un Ha. I'm an application scientist um, slash engineer at Janus ULT. Um, so, so we're a manufacturer of ultra low temperature products that can reach below one Kelvin. Um, well, sometimes they're called millikelvin products as well. Um, I'd like to spend a few minutes to describe our products, capabilities, and hopefully lead to finding opportunities uh, that can boost um, the quantum technology development in the US. So Janus ULT has been in business for 60 years, uh, starting with a wide range of cryogenic products. And as Scott mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, in 2020, we sold off a number of our product ranges and to focus on ultra low temperature. And we have rebranded as Janus ULT. So we're a small business with 22 employees and we are focusing our engineering fabrication talents to the opportunities within quantum technologies. Roughly 50% of our current business is with dilution refrigerators for quantum. And we firmly believe our expertise on custom requirements are building blocks to pursue a good role in cryogenics for quantum technology. Our products range from uh, helium-3 cryostats, which have a base temperature of 300 millikelvin, or dilution refrigerators, which have a base temperature of roughly 10 millikelvin. Um, both type of systems are available in wet or dry configurations. Wet means you need a separate reservoir or a container of liquid helium, and, and you need this for uh, normal operation. And dry systems, on the other hand, you don't need such a reservoir or a container of liquid helium uh, because we have a, a separate cooling source, uh, typically a pulse tube cryocooler. Um, we have gained experience and ex expertise through various collaborations, very smart um, groups worldwide. And, and we've been providing cryogenic solutions for a lot of scientific applications. Some examples, our surface science, materials characterization, and more recently for quantum information science. Um, we have some photos and illustrations of the examples. At the left, we have a cold storage um, set up for a sample that goes into a helium-3 cryostat. And we provide this cryostat to our, um, our OEM uh, uh, partner, Unisoku in Japan. And at the center, uh, it's a wet dilution refrigerator used at NIST for ultra high resolution scanning tunneling microscopy. And on the right, uh, there's a dry dilution refrigerator that we've developed in collaboration with a corporate partner. And it is used for uh, development of quantum computers based on superconducting qubits. So Janus ULT would like to focus on, on ultra low temperature systems for quantum technologies. And we would like to expand our role by bringing the following core capabilities to the quantum cryogenics market uh, based on standard dry, dry dilution solutions and integration of technologies such as RF components, connectors, and also sample loading mechanisms. We would also like to provide consultancy based on feasibility and design studies, and also do prototyping and fabrication. We're open to discuss products or projects for applications requiring millikelvin temperatures. In addition, we are also seeking collaborations or partnerships with government, academia, or corporate entities to catch up with our European competitors of the dry dilution refrigerators. 
our European competitors already have technologies such as integrated RF components, superconducting magnets, sample exchange mechanisms, and such. Although we do have confidence in our position as a US manufacturer of ultra low temperature systems, we are definitely tracking behind our foreign competitors. It is, it is very clear we need more partnerships to reach the next steps. And we believe this is in alignment with the goals of QEDC as well. Also, we understand one of our most immediate challenges to secure funding to, to develop um, these type of uh, technologies for quantum. If you have any questions regarding our products or if you have any ideas for collaboration, feel free to reach us. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks. Um, so with your, um, with your renewed focus, actually, let's go to slide five, go back, yeah. With your renewed focus on dilution refrigerators, uh, you know, uh, how, how do you, um, and, and helium cryostats in the US, and being in the US supply chain, you know, where are you looking most to partner? You know, if, if there's someone in the audience right now, you know, who are you most looking to partner with or what area are you looking to partner the most in? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll both um, providers of components such as RF components, um, like Rich mentioned, pulse tube cryocoolers, high power pulse tube cryocoolers are a must right now. And also some people in the research field the um, with the applications for the quantum. We need to know how to adapt devices to the cryogenic environment, what type of heat load we're looking at, at which stages of the dilution refrigerator. So we're actually looking for a lot of different aspects of the whole cryogenic um, industry. Okay, and then um, actually it was brought up before, so I'll ask it now, um, why pulse tubes? Oh, uh, because, um, Although, um, as Rich mentioned, the pulse tubes have uh, cooling power specifications at 4.2 Kelvin, but they actually reach a lot lower temperature than 4.2 Kelvin, and they, they go below 3 Kelvin, and we need as low as temperature as possible, and that would be advantages for uh, pre-cooling the incoming mixture gas, which is critical for the, uh, the close cycle operation of a dilution refrigerator. I see. Are there other technologies besides pulse tubes that are also useful there? Um, in a dry system, I don't think um, th it has been successful yet. And a wet system? In wet systems, um, you don't need a pulse tube cryocooler. Um, as I mentioned, you need a reservoir of liquid helium that you keep right. replenishing. And, and that kind of provides a pre-cooling source. Okay. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, Mark Carroll. Yes, sir. Uh, let me get the slides up here. It's cold in Montana. <laughs> uh, well, typically it is. And uh, yeah, we are located in August in Montana. for July. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's in the 90s right now and smoky. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, I think it was just released. Um, okay, can you see that? Yeah, you look good, Mark. Excellent. Okay, so uh, yeah, obviously Montana Instruments, we're located in Montana. We uh, no cold, we get about two, two months of summer and then it's back to snowing. So uh, we know a lot about cold here. Um, I My name is Mark Carroll. Uh, I'm the CEO of Montana Instruments. Uh, I took over in that role uh, the end of uh, 2020, and uh, I'm going to just walk through a little bit about our contribution, uh, our continuing role uh, in the quantum ecosystem. Um, it ends up that, you know, we've, we've actually been serving the quantum industry 
for about 12 years. Um, there, this is a list of some of our customers that as you walk down the hallway to our production area, uh, we, we like to recognize and, and get very personal with the principal investigators. Um, we uh, are, you know, something that, that we've been involved in this since it is a very complex science. And we have gone to great lengths to make um, the people who are challenging the state of the art in quantum uh, make their jobs much easier uh, by simplifying their experience so that um, cryogenics is not the constraint, right? You just wanna to get to temperature and start taking that data because that's when, where the physics gets interesting. Um, and we're an American company, obviously. And so uh, our involvement in the QEDC since the first, since it was first formed um, has been very interesting to uh, all of us here at Montana Instruments. We wanna see uh, America win this. Um, and, you know, where, where do we play? We play primarily at 3.5 Kelvin, 1.5 Kelvin. Um, we are involved in applications such as photonics, ion trapping, NV diamond centers, and also education kits. And so we get quite a bit of interest from say the next level universities um, that have teaching labs and they like to buy equipment from us. So that's where it all starts. Uh, and we hope to be part of the edu educating of the quantum workforce. Um, but further to that, um, we are not primarily focused on custom systems or integrating the exotic systems. We're focused on delivering standard products and we have a product portfolio that offers good products, better products and best products. And um, there are occasions where we will step outside of that standard product offering, and those would be where we're getting designed into a quantum computer, as we are, uh, and we get some volume, we get a blanket order with that. Um, in addition, we also do OEM projects where we get multiples of offline quantum material characterization systems. Um, and we've also done some very uh, specific designs to support quant uh, quantum sensors or atomic clocks. This is a little bit of our, our standard product offering. So kind of going from left to right, got CrowdCore, our 50 millimeter chamber, our 100 millimeter chamber, our 200 millimeter chamber. Crowd core is focused on the education side of things. Um, we hope to be participating even with community colleges um, and getting uh, curricula up and running to educate um, folks who can be technicians or, or integrators uh, within the quantum workforce. Um, as you move up in chamber size, obviously you can put in more equipment in there, you can put in motion, you can put in uh, cryo optics, you can um, start to get into magnetics. And uh, where, where, do we, where, where do we differentiate it? So we have an ultra stable thermal sample mount and we have best in class vibration stability. We have high NA cryogenics, um, and we've wrapped this all together with basically push button, simple uh, um, software to run your experiment. So <clears throat> we try to remove the constraint of cryogenics and make it just like a push button type thing to get to temperature, hold temperature stably, and not introduce vibrations into the experiment and so that you get your data that much quicker. A little bit about you know, some of the custom exotic systems. As I mentioned, we are designed into quantum computers, um, quantum networking, 
as well as uh, sensing uh, that being atomic clocks. So a couple examples here of some of the complexity. But again, we, we really take those projects on where there's volume. So uh, that, that's a little bit different than a lot of cryogenic companies. And what are we looking for? What we're looking for today is really, um, you know, anybody who would want to partner in a financial sense, we're a small company in Montana, takes capital uh, to grow. Uh, we have more resources and capability uh, than the capital that we have today. And so uh, we're looking for investors or partners and uh, please check us out at montanainstruments.com. Great, thank you, Mark. You bet. And thanks for uh, rescheduling your flight to Hawaii. Oh yeah, you bet. <laughs> All right, so, so, so Montana, so can you go back to your, uh, your software interface slide? Yes, if I can, let's see here. Right here, oh, right there. One more, yeah, okay, great. So, so Montana Instruments is focused on, you know, bringing simple user interface and operation of these closed cycle cryostats, right? And, yeah. and also what I understand is you're, you're heavily emphasized on deploying modern manufacturing techniques, right? And so as cryotech continues to enable leading quantum technologies, you know, I, can you comment a bit more on the need for this, including your background in manufacturing? Because I, you say you're a small company, um, but you have a tremendous background in modernized manufacturing, right? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, certainly, we are, we are going through a transformation. Um, you know, a lot of cryogenics has grown up, you know, understandably so, uh, as sort of configuring systems to a physicist's requirements because they kind of don't know what they need, right? So it evolves throughout the project. Um, we've been around uh, this enough that there are uh, high occurrence of the same requirements. And so we yeah. did an extensive study of that and said, okay, if we deliver this system to 80% of the customers in this application, they're, they're almost exactly the same. So when we can identify that configuration, now we start to build world-class manufacturing around that. So we'll build a work cell around that and we have uh, you know, enterprise requirements planning around that. So we're buying to a forecast rather than buying to a unique point design, which typically has a lead time of you know, 16 weeks, right? So yeah. now our lead times are down even you know, four to six weeks because we're not starting the clock at PO, we already have all the inventory. We have sub-assemblies built up. And so we're just bringing those sub-assemblies together, doing the final integration and test. Um, and so that's really exciting to see that happen in cryogenics for the first time. And so this, we believe we're creating really the first product company within cryogenics. Great, great. And so with that, uh, you know, so you've got your cryo core for universities, you said, uh, and community colleges. And then you were saying that, you know, your 50 millimeter, 100 and 200 millimeter system. What can you comment on uh, where you're going from here? Uh, well, you know, we, we do get pushed um, on the, on the uh, custom side, you know, for OEMs. And typically they want higher vacuum. They want, um, you know, more cooling power. They want uh, faster cool downs, of course, because ultimately, you know, quantum computer, um, you know, you want to get to temperature, you want to stay there for years. <laughs> so that's a little bit different. However, 
even if you have to do some preventative maintenance, they don't want to take take down a computer for a week, right? Between you know, warm it back up, change out parts, uh, cool it back down. Um, that still has to be fairly quick. So cooling power is important, but I would say primarily it's vacuum and vibration. Um, so we're doing a lot of work there um, to satisfy our customers, our demanding customers, uh, yeah. which are quite different than research customers, right? Research customers are okay with a 16 week lead time. Right. Uh, right. OEM customers are not. And uh, so that's a, that's a little more of a Silicon Valley type approach that you and I know <laughs> quite well. That's also and because that, those cust those customers have customers that don't like that either, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're signing exactly contracts right. that that have penalties for downtime oh, yeah. and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a that's a totally different, um, you know, business architecture, right? You have to be extremely agile, and you have to uh, also start to talk about things like mean time between failure. Yeah. Which you know, right. physicists who are going to be there for seven years anyway, <laughs> they're okay with it going down, and you can send out a technician in a few weeks. But that that's not the case with uh, you know semiconductor uh, capital equipment model, where you you have to have people there immediately, and you have to have spare parts on the floor, things like that. So you know, we're now growing up. Uh, in the quantum, the new paradigm here, which is going to be more similar to semiconductor capital equipment. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Mark. You bet. Great. Okay. I'm going to open this up to, uh, uh, well, actually, it'd be great if all the speakers could go uh, off mute and, and I'd like to ask a question. Noel Goddard uh, from uh, <laughs> had posed a question, uh, which is I think spot on, which is the quantum networking field is routinely using nanowire single photon detectors. You know, how, and maybe we just go round rod them. Anybody who um, is, is game to to answer this, and I know Rich, you had a, a point on your slide about about you know single photon detectors. But do you anticipate further miniaturization of your product line to support detector applications that will in be in-house in server rooms, remote locations. I mean, and, and, and you know, how much are you hearing about this? Uh, it's definitely a topic to discuss for sure, right? So Rich, you wanna start? Sure. Um, yes, we, we've certainly heard, heard of this and we're hearing more of this. Um, so this clearly is uh, the path that uh, we all need to be on and, and we're, starting on that path, like I, I mentioned, um, but it's a leap. Um, really what we're looking for here, right, is a commodity. And certainly we don't consider ourselves a commodity company, um, but these are gonna be, systems are gonna need to gonna be similar to your desktop uh, computer, right? Where you don't even know it's there, it's operating, it's quiet, it plugs right into the wall. Um, and, you know, certainly where we are, at Cryomec, we're not there. And there is a, a big leap uh, that needs to be made and we're, we're looking into it and wanting to collaborate with others. It's gonna take uh, more than just Cryomec for, for cryogenics to get to that place um, that is, is being asked for by this community. Yeah, great, thanks, Rich. Who wants to go next? I would say that uh, we're seeing, you know, pretty similar things from, from our customer base. So. You know, there's definitely a move to um, miniaturize systems and, and go to rack mounted systems and that sort of thing. And there's a couple companies that are, you know, well positioned in the, the single photon detector space. Um, I think what we're also seeing is um, some different technologies that are going to start competing with each other. You know, you might be looking at SNSPDs and you might be seeing some other technologies come online. Um, you know, things like transition edge sensors that have, uh, you know, applications and or have usefulness in, in different application subsets. So depending upon the technology that's required, um, you might see that form factor either be able to shrink down or you might be kind of limited to the uh, the operating temperature of the of the specific detector. Um, but definitely miniaturization is something we're seeing. Okay, great, great. 
Thank you. Anybody else, Mark? Uh, the only thing I would say is I, I'd concur with Jack that, um, you know, there, there are certain detectors that require, you know, a colder temperature. And, you know, unfortunately that comes with uh, a, a degree of complexity and volume of equipment. And almost every customer that I talk to says, gosh, we really got to get this smaller. There's just some efficiency gains to going smaller. However, they keep adding more equipment in, into the chamber. So <laughs> we're not there Definitely. yet. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Well, um, so Celia, can we go to, uh, I think we're running out of time here. Can we go to this, uh, my slide deck again? Yeah, and I guess... Um, We'll talk about that other thing too. I just want to, I want to close this. Yeah. You got to stop sharing Mark. Okay. I want to show, um, it's great that Noel asked that question. So let's go to the webinar schedule. I think that, so, so we've done lasers, we've done quantum sensors, and thanks to all the speakers today, we did crowd technologies. Next up, uh, we plan to do quantum entanglement sources, and we're not necessarily gonna get into single photon detection, but it is part of this whole thing. And part of one of the theses that's, that's out there right now is, is how are we going to connect quantum computers together? How are we gonna connect quantum sensors together? How are we gonna connect quantum computers with quantum sensors, et cetera? and single photon detection is needed for that, so is entanglement sources. Um, we're also looking at, uh, in, in September, we're looking at doing quantum timing. In October and November and January, we're, we're, we haven't locked these in yet, but we're looking at doing one on fabrication services, one on electronics and RF. That's not Midberg sensing, that's actually the electronics that goes into building these quantum systems. Uh, and then also test and measurement uh, for the, basically rounding out this year into January. Um, Celia, do you want to um, have Scott Beckhouse yeah, make a so, statement? Yeah, yeah, if folks can stay on for one minute, Scott Beckhouse at NIST has an announcement he wanted to share with this particular group about their seminar series, a technical seminar series on cryogenics that he thought you all might be interested in. So Scott, over to you. And, yep, we see your screen, but we don't hear you. There we go, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so um, on this uh, seminar series at NIST, we run um, a monthly cryogenics technical seminar series. So it's, it's decidedly a, a technical seminar. It's the second Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. Um, several of the companies that presented here, you have representatives that uh, are, are part of our seminar uh, series. Um, some of the previous presenters, you can see here, Cryomec, Lockheed, HPD, Form Factor, Triton, uh, pretty good representation from the academic community as well, MIT, Purdue, Florida State, NIST as well. Um, upcoming seminars, August 11th, we've got uh, Mark Zagarola from Criari. I think probably several of you know him, uh, University of Chicago coming up in September. If you or any of the representatives from your company would like an invite, just email me directly um, and uh, we'll get you on the list. And uh, I, I think some of the technical Collaboration uh, that underlies the business work uh, can 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 happen through this series as well. So thank you and um, um, uh, thanks to thanks to Mark and Celia for uh, the opportunity to, to uh, advertise this. We're glad to do that. We'll promote it in any way that's appropriate. So um, just send us something. We can put it in uh, on on the member website and so on. But thank you. Thanks for sharing. And I want to thank again uh, all the speakers. Uh, just fantastic presentations. Um, thanks for uh, playing. <laughs>